Do you ever just listen to something that you know makes you feel things because of the th context you heard it in, like last time? Like, sure, it happens in the movies. We got, you know, we get a lot of iconic theme songs from films, most of them with the us usual, you know, swelling fanfare of heroics, trumpets, blah blah, yada yada yada. But then there are some that really just get you, you know? The type of pieces that the moment you hear the opening chord you go oh crap it's about to get real or you know you just start crying <laughs> believe it or not an audio drama did that to me recently and the funny thing is a year ago i didn't even know that was possible you know to do that in a completely oral medium but you know if you're here because i sent you the link I probably don't need to introduce myself to you, but in the interest of fairness, I'm gonna do it anyway. Hi, I'm SJ. It, who I am doesn't really matter. Nothing matters more than what we came here to do. You know, break down just what makes the Penumbra Podcast soundtrack so good. So, the Penumbra Podcast is a podcast, <laughs> but I really just call it an audio drama to detract it from certain associations. It's created by Sophie Takagi Kaner and Kevin Vibert. Initially, the series was an anthology of different genres of fiction. You had your urban horror featuring traumatized children, the surrealist psychological horror that is artist burnout, your lesbian western, your high fantasy magic, and your sci-fi noir. Now, They've narrowed down to the latter two storylines from the original run, their magical fantasy story of the Second Citadel and their science fiction noir drama Juno Steel. So before we really start getting into the meat and potatoes of this, here are some disclaimers. This is not a sponsored video. I was not paid to do this. I'm some 21 year old idiot from the Philippines that got into this audio drama like a year ago. All credits will be linked in the description and the end credits. This video will be focusing on the Juno Steel storyline for reasons you'll understand soon enough. <laughs> I'm sorry to any Second Citadel fans in the crowd. This will not be spoiler free. God knows I was the last person who got caught up in the season 3, so yeah. And lastly, I am not well versed in a lot of things, the English is my second language and I hold no delusions that I am at all educated in music theory, so don't expect anything too well informed and or educational from me. Coherence is the, the base, the base standard here. Okay, so now that that's off my chest, let's start with a summary. Juno Steel is a private eye living in Hyperion City on Mars. With him is his secretary and longtime best friend Rita. No last name. Things start off easy enough with the introduction of Peter Nereev, the elusive thief he wants to catch. Well, in more ways than one. You go along Juno's cases in the first season and get to know the person he shows people who he is. And then, when you think it's going to be a happy ending, they hit you with a metal bat and say this detective's got some unresolved trauma, so no happy ending yet. Season 2 goes into a psyche and backstory. There's some robots in there, an additional subplot in the second half of the season about two old lesbians reuniting, but hey, didn't they have two old lesbians reuniting in the first season too? Is that symbolic or something? No, no, focus. <laughs> There's a drug-induced hallucination of his dead brother and mother. There's his ex-babysitter he helped become the new mayor of Hyperion City and mind-controlling robot chips. And yes, Rita does save the day. I will take no criticisms at this hour. Juno decides to run off before Hyperion traumatizes him further, so he makes a deal with that old lesbian he helped out, Buddy. And Buddy says, okay, come join my found family, and surprise, wouldn't you know it, the guy he left in a hotel back in season 1 is here too. What was his name? I think his name was, uh, Pedro something? <laughs> I don't remember. What did he say it was again? Peter Ransom? That's his name now? Okay, Shane's right. 
Season 3 is about the Yurinko crime family and how Juno gets dragged around while he grows as a person and has adventures with his new found family while they try to steal the cure of all illness from under Big Pharma. <laughs> We've got oldies, uh, Juno, Rita, and Ransom, not Nereev. We've got some sorta of newbies, Buddy, Jet, and Vespa, and together they terrorize billionaires in outer space. It's beautiful. There's a wedding, a car chase, a crash landing, a ball, an alien car, dog thing, a screaming goldfish in a pickle jar, and some exploding robots. Not necessarily in that order, but most importantly, there's found family. And that's about it so far. So, let's get down to business. To make my job easier, I'm going to talk about the themes by breaking them down through which instrument was used and why. Then afterwards, I'll tell you all my thoughts about it, right? Okay, you don't really have a choice. Let's just keep going. Part 1. Haunting electric guitars, filters, and repetition. So, if you ever listen to the soundtrack for the storyline, the one thing you'll notice is the insane amount of electric guitar everywhere. It's in Juno's theme. In the Ray of Steam. In Juno and the Ray of Steam. And in the Ruby 7. Needless to say, you really get the feeling that they really like electric guitar and or the specific chord progression that I've come to associate with the steels because it also plays in Ben Zeiton's and in Sarah's. I like to think of the rawer sounding electric guitar as identity themes. You know, more often than not, if it's a piece like that, it's one that you'll hear before the opening monologue or during the outro monologue, like the way Juno's theme has always played since the first two seasons. There's a power to its vulnerability, just the lonesome sound of an electric guitar in a kind of empty auditorium feel as this character tells you about their deepest insecurities that no one else gets to hear about. And it's when there's more added to it that you can find other ideas to associate with them. Whether the sound of the guitar is softer over the sound of percussion, which we'll get to in a bit, or it's projected through the sound of a speaker, or when there's significantly more crunch to it. Like, take this track from season 2 called I Didn't Want to Die. This piece plays while Juno's on the test of charity, when Marshall the Ark is taking an amount of blood you should never take from another human being unless you want a corpse at your feet. This theme represents Juno's anger in this scene as he realizes for the first time in the past however many episodes that he finally wants to live. And it's in the middle of him about to die. The interference of that near ear-shattering crunchy guitar playing just hammers down the anger that's giving him the energy to struggle to stay alive. It's a powerful scene made even more powerful with all the subliminal, you know, conditioning we get with the sound of electric guitars. It really just boosts your entire experience with the story when you notice it yourself. And that's not like a one-off one thing. The little fry they give to the electric guitar continues on. When he sees Nureyev again at the end of season 2, you get the same sound. You also get it in the Ray of Steam in season 3, and <laughs> here's one that really makes me want to cry. You get it in Buddy's second theme. And it all calls back to I didn't want to die. Because in the scene that Take Your Advice plays, Buddy very explicitly says that she doesn't want to die. It is one of the most beautifully written, enacted, and produced scenes I've ever had the privilege to listen to in my entire goddamn life, 10 out of 10, have listened to it so many times over, recommend. Heart of it all is the best episode of season 3. I will take no criticisms, ever. Alright, 
all that aside, none of this will work if there's no like subliminal conditioning in there with the repetitions. Because these repetitions of these themes throughout the seasons really does do a lot of heavy lifting for the emotions of the scenes they're playing in. For example, Play It Again Sam, Buddy and Vespa's theme. It has that added element of brass to it that emphasizes Buddy's Catherine Hepburn vibes and serves as something that replays later on in Take Her Advice. And you know that the former informed the latter <laughs> because, uh, you know, because of chronology, but also because of, you know, you can really hear it that Buddy sees her relationship with Vespa as something to live for as well as something that she'll die happy having. She even verbalizes it in her vows, saying that if having this life with Vespa and her family was a dream, then she never wants to wake up. And you can tell Ryan Vibert reverse engineered this and incorporated parts of it to Buddy's character theme, a patchwork woman, and Vespa's theme, more trouble than I'm worth. Both are emotionally vulnerable themes, as both themes were played in narration while both of them were very resolute of going away you know buddy buddy's determined that she's going to die to get this family through to their final moments and vespa's determined that she's not worth much to team anymore if she keeps endangering them but buddy's theme has that same meandering yearning to it that was present in the brass elements of played against sam almost as if she's missing what could be if she left now? Vespa's is more... It's, f it's very foundational in the way that it acts like its own tether and its stubbornness, you know? No matter how fried the sound is, no matter how it sounds faded, and that's cool because this is the first time you hear Vespa's theme in Shadows on the Ship, but you can imagine how much deeper and richer it could have sounded before all this. Here's another example of all that repetition stuff. The way that there was never a theme for Hyperion City. That Hyperion City isn't a character in this story. Okay, so Hyperion City, the track, plays on in the scene where Juno walks out on the rev at the end of season one, when Juno gives his final monologue. And though it's called Hyperion City, it's very distinctly Juno's theme. It's the same chord progression arranged identically, but it's missing a few key elements. Namely that it's an acoustic, but also because it's missing the certain twangs to it that really make it Juno's. It's hollowed out, deprived of the rich and heavy themes of the electric guitar that gave gave it that death before it's it's still Juno's theme, but none of the things that made his theme shine. And that's because Juno's hit rock bottom in this scene. You really get to hear that, the way that turning away a happy middle with Nereev broke him open that he thinks is the right thing to do. He feels that he's made a lot of messes with Nereev and that he's one of them, and he'd rather not spread that mess around. Oh, <sighs> damn. Alright, okay, I think that's enough about the goddamn electric guitars. <laughs> Percussions and family. Percussions are sexy. There, I said it. The first time percussions get introduced to the soundtrack is in Places Cameraman. And the context, I believe, is that shit's about to go down because Nerev and Juno just got cuffed to the stupid torture chair and are about to die unless they plan their way out. I've characterized it as the let's get down to business sound of the Junoverse, really, because the contexts in which you hear percussion playing on in the pieces are when things are about to or starting to speed up, like in From the Jaws of Death when they need to get out of the chair, the Ruby 7 theme when they're about to escape the Oasis to get to the Guard Express drone launch, and in the themes of our resident people who go about their lives like they're trying to run from something. <laughs> And the interesting thing about percussions in the Juniverse soundtrack is just how incredibly versatile they are. Because you hear them in those contexts, yes, but you also hear it in Juno's and Buddy's life themes. A metaphorical speeding up from the way depression really bogs you down. And it's most interesting in Buddy's context too, 
because one of the purely percussion songs in the entirety of all three scores is Jet and Buddy's relocation services. And given that context, you can see how Jet and Buddy's relationship also motivated her to stay alive at the end of Heart of It All. And it doesn't end there, because Relocation Services really does love being the star of the show. <laughs> at the end of the third season, Relocation Services ends up cementing itself as the Arinka crime family theme. Because when Jet takes over planning their first idea of escaping dark matters, it starts playing. I mean, I, I would want this to be a deliberate decision made after years of adding these motifs into the themes, and it probably isn't, but given that this is my video, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> it adds depth to the previous instances that you hear percussion, specifically to the theme songs dropped in the third season. I'm not taking that for granted that Buddy thinks of her family in the time she selfishly saves herself. The Rita's theme, the model Rita's theme, comes as a reminder in the story that though the incidents in Mega Ultra Boss are, you know, close between her, Juno, and Nereev, she's still doing this for the entire family. That though Nereev thinks the idea of family is odd to put in a workplace context, he's still pulling all this effort to prove himself capable to this family. And excuse me if this sounds crass, but that's fucking sexy. We love nuance in our soundtracks. Me specifically, because I, I don't see you making this video. Just kidding. Half kidding. Anyway, <laughs> there's another instrument I haven't talked about, and I saved it for later because I, I have been thinking about this since before Season 3 soundtrack dropped. <laughs> Part 3. Acoustic guitars, memory, home, and diet. How do you sp how do you say that? Diegetic. Acoustic guitars, memory, home, and diegetic and non-diegetic music. Good God, the acoustics! The first time we heard an acoustic guitar was way back in season one, and in, in a little episode called Peter Nureyev and the Angel of Brahma, <laughs> the only episode not named after Juno Steel that isn't a bonus episode. The theme, Thief Without a Home, played diegetically once during a scene where Nerev gets distracted from ransacking someone's office to imagine a life on New Kinshasa. The second time you hear it, spoiler alert, is in the scene where Mag dies. And the third time, two seasons later, is as non-diegetic music. You hear it when Nerev finally lets Juno talk to him in Man in Glass. And that is a lot of meanings to unpack because it's, it literally speaks to Nereev's idealism as a person, how he wants a place he could finally call his own, that the person he called his own people wants to destroy that, how he's willing to sacrifice his own wants almost self-destructively and convince himself he never needed it, how no matter how many years pass, he'll never be able to actually convince himself he doesn't want a place to call his own. And that sets the precedent for all acoustic themes, because it tells us that any theme played with an acoustic guitar stands for distant idealism, nostalgia, or home. Hyperion City is a theme about the idea of what Hyperion stands for to Juno, his home, the good, the bad and ugly, and all the memories that go with it. Any day now is a key, one that unlocks the failsafe to the Kira Mother Prime, and unlocks that rusty old cage in Jet's Kuliak. It represents and is sung by a person from Jet's past that throws a lot of wrenches in Jet's plans because he would literally rather not remember things very much. And it's interesting to me that both Jet and Nereev's yearning themes are diegetic, as if it would never occur to them to want something so bad unless faced with the existence of it in front of them. And these themes are wholly necessary. They're not allowed to be left out of the story because it'll never work. Jet is supposed to grieve for the losses he committed, and Nereev is supposed to want something he thinks he can never have. Those hurts are fundamental to their characters, and they remain constant. Because again, these themes come up in the plot multiple times. Death's reconciliation with the past becomes the thing that gives his family access to their collective goal. 
He uses his hurt to help others. And the Rev becomes the opposite. He uses his hurt to help himself. Because denying it the first time hurt himself. And if that's not poetic, I don't know what is. We haven't even talked about the only other diegetic theme in the entire series. Well, we've talked about it multiple times, but here we go again. Play it against Sam. Only... This one isn't played in Buddy's POV, interestingly enough. It should be, but it's an outlier in that it plays diegetically in Juno's POV. And Buddy tells him very specifically that it's something you get used to. Because, oh right, it's been years since Buddy's seen Vespa. So no wonder she's gotten used to the idea of longing for her and them to the point that the grief of the potential loss just plays on the background of her own life. It phases back and forth from diegetic to non-diegetic, it weaves in and out of Buddy's episodes, and comes back diegetic in the best way possible. Part 4. Strings in Love Peter Nureyev's depressing instrument. I know, not the sexiest way of putting it, but I digress, because this is actually an important point to make. <laughs> Violins occur only twice in the entirety of the series' soundtrack so far. The first time was, and I don't know if this is something most first-time listeners of the Penumbra pick up on, but it comes on during Nereyev's introduction. Hom Fatale plays when Juno turns around and describes what Nereyev, then Rex Glass, looks like to our discerning audience. And that's really nice of him to have that thirst moment, I guess, but this cliched surge of violin music really gets to you. It really tells you that Juno's kind of got a bad for this dude that he met for the first time that day. And hey, you're right. You're right for about two seasons ahead. <laughs> and it's fitting, really, that the the first time we've seen a ray of a violin plays, because he does get to play it later on for Buddy and Festival's wedding. And again, in Juno's POV. And you get the sense really in the two times you hear violence in the entirety of the series, that this is an instrument reserved only for romance and Nereyev. Because you never hear it outside of that context. That even in Buddy and Vespa's wedding ceremony, when the violin starts playing, Juno isn't looking at Buddy and Vespa, he's looking at Nereyev. And he's thinking about Nereyev. And that absolutely disgusting monologue begins to just tears your goddamn heart out about love and choice and uh. <sighs> Now, this is my reading of it, take it with a grain of salt, but I find it so goddamn poetic that Nereyev and any vulnerable emotion has such a complicated relationship with being diegetic and non-diegetic, especially in Juno's POV, because it's thematic. Juno thinks, and has always thought, if Nereyev trusting in him, believing in him, and loving him are possible things. The way it turns out that way, even in the music, is just so good. <sighs> Conclusions You can really tell that the storyline always has been quite the passion project to the Penumbra crew, even without having listened to any of the retrospectives they've had in the past few months since the third season finale, you can really tell that the stories they tell, a lot of thought was put into those. I can go on for probably a few more minutes. They <laughs> recently just introduced piano to the soundtrack, and that excites me for reasons I cannot even begin to describe. But I fear I've run on for too long anyway, so I'll cut it there. You can see a lot with a soundtrack, and with music used so sparingly in the series itself, it's a wonder that it can enhance so much. It wouldn't have this big an impact if not for the masterful way that it's placed in the episodes. So, what have we learned? Every instrument has its own idea attached to it. The Juno soundtrack enhances a lot of emotions in every scene it's used in. I think percussions are sexy. One of those is much more important than the others. You decide. Anyway, you've if you've made this this far, kudos to you. I'll, I'll give you this gold star. Thank you for listening to me ramble about the Juno Steel storyline for however long this video is going to be. Feel free to yell at me in the comments, like the video if it was entertaining to hear me say all these things, and uh, make sure to support the Penumbra crew. 
Uh, I'll also link to my Kofi and socials down there in case you guys want more content like this from me. Um, shout out to the playground and my followers for enabling me to make this. I love you all. Um, ingat lahat. Always wear a mask. Bye!